All right, well, my name is uh, Jill Argenbright. I'm one of the pediatric otolaryngologists at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. And uh, I, I appreciate you guys listening and tuning in uh, today. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys about uh, a topic that you many people don't get very much exposure to in their residency, and that's uh, velopharyngeal dysfunction probably better known as velopharyngeal insufficiency, um, but we'll talk about kind of how velopharyngeal dysfunction is then kind of the new term uh, that we're using a little more all-encompassing um, for uh, the description of children with these issues. And so what I wanted to cover today is I wanted to um, give you all an understanding of what velopharyngeal dysfunction is. Um, to discuss how patients with uh, VPD uh, are evaluated, uh, go through the different treatment options for VPD, including surgical uh, management. And then at the end, I have uh, some VPD cases uh, to kind of walk you through and, uh, and show some videos there. So talking about normal speech, um, all sounds in the English language except the M sound, the N sound, and the ing sound come out of our mouth. All the air comes out of our mouth when we say those sounds. Uh, the M, the N, and the ing sound all come out of our nose. All of the air is directed out of our nose to make those three sounds. And it's kind of a, a fun um, a trick to play or you can test yourself. So if you say the sound um, M like mm, and you plug your nose, all of the air stops and the sound completely stops. This is in comparison to if you're saying the P sound, pop, 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 pop. plugging your nose makes no difference because there's no air coming out of your nose when you're making that sound. Um, and so you can kind of give that theory a test on your own. Um, and so uh, basically what happens when we are making all of the other sounds uh, other than M, N, and ing, uh, the soft palate lifts up into our velopharynx and I have kind of where the anatomical uh, velopharynx is defined, uh, but just for our patient's sake and how we talk about this um, in clinic, it's basically the space between the nose and the mouth. And that space closes off so that all of the sound is directed out of the mouth when we're talking. So basically what happens is the palate lifts up, closes off that space between the nose and the mouth, and then the air uh, is directed out of the mouth. For kids uh, that have velopharyngeal dysfunction, that, that mechanism does not work properly. Uh, for various reasons. So the, the space between the mouth and the nose is not getting completely closed off. And so this lets air escape up into the nose and, and come out the nose during speech. And so you have air coming out the mouth, but because you don't have this area between the mouth and the nose completely sealed off, you're also going to be leaking air out the nose. And that is um, then, then defined as velopharyngeal dysfunction. So what are the symptoms of this? What does this cause? Uh, it can make speech uh, sound different. It sounds uh, more nasally. Uh, it's described as hypernasal speech. Can make speech very difficult to understand. Um, some of our patients truly have unintelligible speech because there's so much air loss out their nose. Sometimes you can hear the air coming out their nose. It's called audible nasal air emissions where you can actually hear the windy uh, uh, air loss out of their nose. And sometimes we'll see patients that in addition to the speech issues are actually leaking liquids or in rare cases food out their nose um, because that soft palate's really not getting closed. Um, so why do we care? Why do I care? This is really my uh, passion, the clinical passion, and uh, why, why, why do we care about VPD? Well, this is a big uh, impactor for quality of life. And uh, I just wrote down some of the things that I hear commonly in my clinic of what patients or parents are saying uh, about, uh, about the issues that VPD is causing uh, for them. Their children are frustrated uh, because people don't understand them and they have to keep saying, what did you say? What did you say? I can't understand you. And so that causes a lot of frustration for kids that um, are trying to communicate and aren't being understood. Um, Kids are getting made fun of at school, and this is, and some of my patients led to bullying. Um, kids 
asking them, why do you talk funny? Why do you talk different? Um, kids can be self-conscious. This can cause them to struggle at school. They can withdraw from social settings. It's, they don't want to be around other people. They don't want to um, have to talk. Um, and then um, I had a um, few older girls that reported being embarrassed to read out loud and give presentations um, in class. Um, and so there's actually um, a, a huge impact of quality of life uh, for children with BPD. And there's actually research that's ongoing for um, kind of to look more objectively at quality of life impact on these patients. There is a validated questionnaire um, out of Seattle that's called the VLO or the VPI effects on life outcomes uh, that we're using in our clinic. So uh, VPD, who gets it and what patients do we see this in? Uh, cleft palate is a common population, uh, 10 to 20% of patients, kind of depending on which report you read, uh, which uh, study you read, um, they'll have some degree of residual VPD after their cleft repair. Uh, children that have a submucous cleft palate can have uh, issues with VPD. It's very common to see this in children with 22Q deletion syndrome, uh, where they have more of a neurogenic palate, but their palate just doesn't move uh, properly in a lot of cases. Children that have motor speech disorders or neuromuscular issues or uh, cranial neuropathies that are affecting palate motion can have this issue. Um, I see this uh, fairly frequently in children that have genetic abnormalities, so maybe not a defined syndrome per se, but a syndrome that, uh, but a genetic abnormality that, that may include some hypotonia issues, uh, we can see this in. Uh, for ENT, we always worry about this with the adenoidectomy. You know, at, we, we talk about it as our, in our risks as far as um, uh, when you're counseling families before an adenoidectomy, the risk of creating BPI, it's actually pretty rare to have this happen after an adenoidectomy. Um, again, it, depending on which study you look at, one in 1,500 to one in 10,000, so pretty rare, but still can happen. And we also see this in, in idiopathic uh, cases where, you know, kids are otherwise healthy and they don't have a submucous cleft palate and they don't have a syndrome and they don't have history of cleft palate and they're still having this issue. Uh, so this is a, uh, one of the takeaways I wanted you guys to, to, you know, kind of understand the three different definitions or quote unquote types of VPD. Um, and this is why we've changed to using uh, velopharyngeal dysfunction is more of an all encompassing term and using VPI uh, in, in a little bit more in specific cases because of these uh, terms uh, and, and definitions. So VP insufficiency is defined as an abnormal structure. And so that I think of as you don't have, you, you have insufficient tissue or insufficient structure. So the muscles are not in the proper alignment. So like a submucous cleft palate would be defined as VP insufficiency. Same with if you did an adenoidectomy and now the palate can't reach the uh, back of the throat or back of the nose the, um, you would call that more of a VP insufficiency. And that's in contrast to VP incompetence, which is going to be describing abnormal movement. And that is where we get into kind of the neurogenic um, or hypotonic uh, palate where the, the structure is normal, uh, the muscles are in the proper location, it just doesn't move very well. And so that is def that's called VP incompetence. And then the third one um, is called VP mislearning. And uh, this is really interesting where it sounds specific. So somewhere along the way, uh, the child has learned to push air out their nose for certain sounds. And, and so all the other sounds that are made perfectly and the palate closes, it's not a structural issue. It's not a movement issue. It's a learned issue. And, and uh, common sounds that we see this on are S's and Z's, CH sounds, um, where the child somewhere along the way decided, hey, I'm, air is supposed to come out my nose when I make the S sound. And, and so that is a mislearning of sound production and not a specific palate uh, issue. The other important point is that the, velo, the velopharyngeal port and the closure of that um, is a completely for, for voluntary speech 
is a completely separate neurocognitive pathway than for swallowing. And so most of our patients actually will get that velopharynx completely closed when they swallow, when we're watching these, the, our, our videos. And then when they go to make voluntary speech, they can't get that area to close off. And so that's very interesting that these are two separate neural pathways for swallowing and voluntary speech as far as uh, getting the, the velopharyngeal port closed. So how do we go about diagnosing VPD? Um, there are uh, several different ways. And we usually use a, a collection of several of these uh, when we're working up patients with suspected VPD. Um, the first one we start with is a speech evaluation, and that's specifically called per a perceptual testing or looking for resonance um, issues. Uh, obviously, you can test, you can do a two hour speech evaluation looking for articulation issues and a whole various other uh, things that the speech therapist can go through. But for if we're specifically looking for air loss out the nose that's inappropriate, then we're talking about perceptual speech testing or looking for resonance, a resonance disorder. And so we always, I, I rely heavily on my speech therapist team um, to screen these kids and to evaluate them with the, their speech evaluation. Um, there are a little bit more objective measures where they can, um, call, uh, using a mirror, can actually put the mirror or a dental uh, mirror um, underneath the nose and watch for fogging of that. And that would suggest that there's air loss out the nose uh, when the child's talking. And the same uh, principle can be used with a straw where one end of the straw is placed just on the kind of outside of the patient's nostril. The other end of the straw is placed uh, uh, by the uh, speech therapist's ear. And that really amplifies any air that's sneaking out the nose, then it's much easier to hear that kind of windiness if, um, uh, if, that's, if they are losing air out their nose. Um, nasometry is a technique, this patient over here uh, with the head uh, contraption and the uh, over on the right uh, is, that's nasometry. And so this is an objective um, way to rate uh, the air loss out the nose. So a patient wears this um, a device and there is a, um, a plate that sits between his nose and the mouth and then it actually records air loss onto that plate and then that feeds into a computer and gives you an objective kind of number or rating as far as the amount of air coming out of the nose. Um, now this is a nice because it does give you uh, a very objective like a number that you can report. Um, so good for research. You can imagine though like technically there is this is a, can some in, in, in you know a handful of cases this can be a little hard to get kids to comply with um, and, and to wear the device. Um, video fluoroscopy is another technique. This is done in um, the fluoro uh, lab and uh, you can see the radiologic pictures. You're actually watching that soft palate move um, up in, you know, and, and you can rate and see kind of they've shown some arrows here how the, you know, cl how close or how much closure that soft palate's getting. Um, using um, fluoroscopy. And then uh, the technique that I use most commonly is nasopharyngoscopy, where we actually use our flexible laryngoscope and sneak this into the nose, uh, get back to the nasopharynx and actually watch that soft palate lift up, watch the velopharyngeal port, watch for any um, openings, gaps, uh, where air is sneaking out inappropriately. And uh, we'll, I have some videos of those to share uh, in a little bit. So when we're evaluating for VPD, um, this is best done in a multidisciplinary setting and with at least the surgeon and the speech therapist. And the setup will really vary amongst institutions. I'm sure many of you listening, um, your VPD, where your children with VPD are getting evaluated can, can really vary. Um, uh, even the surgeon that does these surgeries varies from um, pediatric otolaryngologist to a cleft craniofacial surgeon to a plastic surgeon um, and, and kind of how they are seen, what the most multidisciplinary clinic looks like. 
um, whether they're seen in the cleft team, whether they're seen in a specific BPD clinic, um, can really be uh, can really vary institution to institution. So just wanting to highlight how we do it at Children's Mercy. Um, we have a specific BPD clinic that meets uh, three half days a month uh, with myself and a speech therapist. Um, we see any child that has a resonance uh, um, or hypernasality concerns. And so we have a, a, a pretty broad referral uh, pattern. We get referrals from our speech therapist team, from my colleagues in ENT, from our genetics department, from our plastics team. A lot of the children, again, with 22Q on our 22Q team are identified as having um, hypernasal, hypernasality concerns for BPD are referred to us. And we also have a pretty robust um, referral base from outside providers uh, within the region. Um, who we don't see is children with an overt cleft palate. And those uh, patients are seen uh, in our cleft team that is run by our plastic surgery department. And just a note, we have a really great relationship between our cleft team and the VPD team and share patients. Um, and so I think that's uh, something that's really uh, important to have a good relationship um, if, you're, if your teams are separate. So how does it work? Again, I mentioned that it's myself and our speech therapist. We also have a child life specialist that helps out uh, with our scope exams. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Our uh, new patient visits are 60 minutes long. And there are four main parts to the visit where we get a history and physical, we do a speech testing. If it's deemed appropriate, we then move on to the nasopharyngoscopy exam. And then we discuss recommendations from there, whether that's surgery or speech therapy. And we'll talk more about treatment options in a little bit too. Things that we're looking for with the history, we're asking the families, what are their speech concerns? How long has this been going on for? Is the child in therapy? If so, what are they working on? Getting a past surgical history, whether a cleft palate issue, you know, have the history of cleft palate adenoidectomy. Are they having liquids come out their nose when they're talking or just when they're, sorry, when they're drinking? And um, this one I think is really important. You're asking the families, what is the percent that the family is able to understand of the patient's speech. And usually the parents are pretty good. They say, oh yeah, we can understand 90% of what the child's saying. But it, the, the real kicker is when you ask what, the, what a stranger would be able to understand. And a lot of times this is much lower than what the parents who are around the child all the time um, uh, can understand. And so sometimes I'll say 20%, a, a stranger can only understand 20% of what my child says. And this is where you get into the quality of life issues or this child can't communicate at school um, or with, with friends or with um, relatives and those types of things. Um, does, so we ask about obstructive breathing because any uh, BPD surgery is going to, to potentially cause some increased risk of uh, airway obstruction. And so trying to get a baseline of does a child snore at night or have obstructive breathing. And I think it's always, it's always important anytime you're dealing with anything speech related to just touch on the hearing concerns and make sure we're not missing a hearing loss in addition to um, you know, speech issues. Physical exam, we want to look at um, the soft palate is really the, the meat of the physical exam. Uh, we're looking uh, very closely for the submucous cleft triad. So you guys probably have memorized this for boards, but the triad for identifying a submucous cleft palate is a bifid uvula, which is a split uvula. You can see this in this lower left picture. A zona pellucida. Now this is, um, a basically a bluish kind of hue that is uh, down the midline of the soft palate. And this is the best picture, this the middle one that I've had of a patient with a zona pellucida. You can kind of see it right here in this middle, this like light blue hue. And basically what that, that's representing is that there's like no muscle underneath that layer. There is just the nasal mucosa and the oral mucosa, and there's a deficiency of mucosa in the midline. And so you almost have this like see-through pattern or, or, you know, it's more described as a bluish hue, but a thinned out mucosa in that central part. And then hard palate notching, if you get your finger in there and you feel the, the ridge of the hard palate uh, as, it, uh, as it adheres to the soft palate, um, you can oftentimes feel a notch that will, again, uh, help you identify a submucous cleft palate. Another important piece is actually watching that palate move. So kind of commenting on, is it, 
does it look like it's lifting up a lot when the child is phonating or is it barely moving at all? Is it symmetric? Do you see one side raising and one side not raising? Um, and then also again, kind of along the obstruction side of things, we do wanna note the tonsil size in the back of the throat. So the next part of the exam is that perceptual speech testing where uh, my speech therapist will do li uh, listening, listening to the child talks, um, guiding them through several different specific phrases that make them say sounds that um, we're listening for to see if there's air loss out the nose. And then they proceed with a straw test and or a mirror test to um, kind of uh, uh, be an adjunct to their listening. Um, and, uh, and then based on their assessment, we determine if that patient is a good candidate or would, would, you know, would benefit from having that flexible nasal pharyngoscopy exam. Usually this is the parent's uh, reaction when we talk about uh, the flexible nasal pharyngoscopy exam um, because what we need to happen is we need to have the scope placed into the child's nose and we need the child then to have voluntary speech. Uh, and we're doing these scopes on children that are three years old and older. And so you can imagine telling a, a parent of a four year old, yeah, we want this scope in her mouth or sorry, scope in her nose. And then we want her to, to, to repeat all of these different phrases with the scope in her nose. And, uh, and actually we have a pretty good hit rate for getting the, a really good exam. And that in part is because uh, we spend a lot of time kind of preparing for the scope exam in clinic. Um, I feel like our child life therapist is really, really helpful. This is a, the, a master's degree um, uh, where they, they, the child life spe specialists have a master's degree and they work closely with the child and the family to describe the, the procedure in terms that the child can understand. They help with distraction. They have iPad games and things that the child can listen to or play while we're doing the numbing process and then if they want to while we're doing the scope exam as well. So I, I find that they're really helpful in uh, guiding the child uh, and the family through the procedure. Um, we also spend a lot of time numbing up the nose and so um, we, uh, we use a the topical spray, which is a combination of Afrin and 1% lidocaine. And then in addition to that, um, we place uh, Q-tips, uh, like the Q-tip uh, end uh, with some 4% uh, topical lidocaine jelly into the nose and kind of try to get it up by a little farther back, back by the middle turbinate. And again, while the, we try to leave those in for a minute or two and then repeat that times one. And this is where the child life specialist can be really helpful. The child can be playing a game or watching a movie while we have these Q-tips in place. Um, and then when we're ready for the scope, um, one unique thing, you know, I, I think when we talk, we people are like, well, you know, we scope kids and babies all the time as ENTs and we do, but you kind of, again, one of the things you just kind of push the scope in and you get past the nose and the kid's screaming and you look at the larynx. This, this is a totally different exam because you need the kids to be like voluntarily, get, you know, they need to be calmed down, they need to be willing to participate. And so getting them ready for the scope is a little bit more unique than a lot of our, the, the instances that we would scope a, a child to, to look specifically at their larynx. Um, the position of the scope also changes when we're doing these nasopharyngoscopy exams for BPD. Um, we are placing the scope up it, higher into the nose versus Normally what you're taught is to ride the floor of the nose uh, by the inferior turbinate. Uh, in this case, we want to place the scope up higher, come alongside the middle turbinate, and then actually look down onto the velopharynx. You'll get a much better view of what's going on. So a little different uh, technique in scope placement. Uh, so what we're looking for during the nasopharyngoscopy exam, um, obviously the palate structure again. Um, there is a, a sign called a seagull sign where I have two pictures over here onto the right where there's this midline divot. So the, what you're looking at here is the scope is positioned into the um, back of the nose. So you're looking at the nasopharynx. On the top, you see the adenoid pad here. And on the lower part, this is the soft palate. And normally this is just kind of like a straight line across and you can see these V's or these divots in the midline, and that's significant for a submucous cleft palate. And again, we're also looking at palate movement. So as the, as the palate elevates, as the child is, is attempting voluntary speech, saying puppy, 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 
are is the palette lifting in an asymmetric fashion does it seem sluggish does it seem very like hypomobile sometimes we see these like really bouncy soft palettes where they lift up really quickly and high but they can't really maintain they don't they don't have like a, 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 a they can't maintain the elevation so they look bouncy when they're moving and then we're also commenting on the lateral and posterior pharyngeal wall movement. So not only just how is the soft palate moving, but how is the sides of the back of the throat uh, um, helping with closure and potentially the posterior pharyngeal wall as well. And then this is a little bit more uh, detailed, but we're looking at um, is there a gap present? So is there is there a, is there air leaking out the nose? So and then if so, can you see can you see a gap? So sometimes these gaps are really small. Sometimes they're they're like pinpoint small, where all you can see is just a bubbling of air coming up from from the mouth, kind of through the the velopharynx. And sometimes they're uh, so so smaller gaps. Kind of this top picture, the bottom picture shows a much larger gap where there's just like a huge you know cavity. A crater here where uh, air is, is leaking from the mouth up into the nose. And then we have a way of, of rating the closure pattern based on how much the lateral walls are helping with closure uh, versus the palate. And that is um, something that we document on all of our scope exams as well. Another thing that's important to look for, be mindful of, is midline pulsations. And so again, something you might have memorized for boards is that uh, something uh, relatively common in 22Q, or at least more common in 22Q, would be to have medialized carotids. So instead of the carotids running on the sides of the neck, they take a funky path. They go to the middle of the back of the throat um, and kind of medialize and then come back out laterally. And so sometimes you can catch this on a scope exam. And it should trigger in your brain if you see this, uh, uh, should kind of trigger you to think about 22Q. Or if you're seeing a 22Q patient, you want to be looking, looking for this. This might impact your surgical decision uh, process. So th with this video, I want you guys to watch kind of this patient's mid right uh, um, side here. If you can see that, It'll, you'll see it kind of bounding away there. In comparison to the glottis, we're pretty medial. I'll run it one more time. You can see that carotid kind of bounding away there. Some, so, so something again to note uh, on our scope exams. So why is this scope helpful? Well, it helps determine if the patient would benefit from a surgery. It assists me in determining which surgery that I want to recommend. And then it also assists me intraoperatively because I really try to tailor the, the surgery to the specific patient. And so I'm looking at uh, the height and the, the gap size and, and trying to use the video intraoperatively to make this the best surgery for each patient specifically. So I wanted you to just see a video of like what a normal scope kind of would look like. This is cut short, obviously, but in this, uh, this patient, um, I'll run the camera, but he has a, a circular closure pattern. So you'll see the lateral uh, walls are, are closing uh, and creating kind of a, a, a circular gap. Um, this patient is a little unique because he has a variable gap size. So you'll see on certain sounds, he actually gets pretty good closure. And on other sounds, there's just a giant gap there. And so he's a little bit unique in that. Um, I do not see any evidence of a submucous cleft palate. There isn't that kind of, I didn't see any on his oral exam, but also we're not seeing that kind of seagull sign, that midline divot. And if you watch closely, you'll see there's a point where the patient actually swallows and gets full closure, but then not, he's not getting full closure with voluntary speech. And again, that's due to that different neurocognitive pathway. So let me just run this video. Uh -huh. 
Okay, well, hopefully you guys were able to see and hear that um, kind of what we're looking for with our scope exams. So moving on to treatment options. Um, so we talked about there being two main ones and then the third one I won't, I'll just briefly touch on, but speech therapy, uh, if the, uh, uh, and versus a, surg a speech surgery or surgery to correct uh, VPD. Um, the third is a speech appliance or an obturator, which is like a, like a giant retainer that actually has like a bulb that sits way into the back and actually closes off the space um, physically with, a, uh, with an obturator um, that the patient wears uh, during speech and can take it out at night, kind of like a, a huge retainer. And uh, these would be really specific to patients who are not uh, surgical candidates. Uh, it's, it's historically not very well tolerated by patients, has to be um, kind of revised and remade several times as the patient's growing. And uh, overall, it is not used very commonly in my practice, but at least wanted to highlight it as a uh, treatment option. Um, just to touch on the speech therapy option, um, we recommend speech therapy for patients that are diagnosed with speech disorders other than BPD. So sometimes patients have been referred to our, our clinic for concerns of hypernasality, but it turns out it's more of an articulation issue. Um, those kids obviously just need speech therapy. <clears throat> Kids that have that VP mislearning that we talked about where it sounds specific, uh, they, they just need therapy. They just need to relearn how to make that sound, like the S sound or the Z sound out their mouth, and they do not need a surgery for this. So that's important. Even though they have air loss out their nose on certain sounds, if it sounds specific, VP mislearning, um, then they uh, speech therapy is a treatment for them. We also use this in uh, kids that I classify being in the gray area where with their scope exam, you know, they can get closure, but maybe not every time, or it, they can't maintain it with longer phrases. So it looks like their palate's moving well, but it's not, uh, it's it sometimes, you know, sometimes it's not that good. And sometimes they can't, like, they can do it well with single, like, puppy, but then when you get them going on a sentence, they can't uh, get, keep their palate closed, and they have issues with air loss with longer phrases. So with those kids where it's not really cut and dry, we'll have them continue really targeted specific therapy with our VPD therapist, speech therapist, and then they'll come back to our clinic and assess to see if they've improved or not. And ultimately, we want patients to fail conservative management before we're talking about surgery. So we want them to fail the speech uh, therapy option first. Uh, there are uh, essentially five uh, surgeries for VPD. Um, that can be uh, done that I'm going to touch on today. The pharyngeal flap, sphincter pharyngoplasty, furlopalatoplasty, injection pharyngoplasty, and buccal flap. Um, so the pharyngeal flap in uh, medical terms is a superiorly based myomucosal flap from the posterior pharyngeal wall that's elevated and in, in set into the back or, or in, of the soft palate. Um, and the way I describe it to families uh, is, is essentially that it's building a bridge between the posterior pharyngeal wall and the soft palate using mucosa and muscle from the, from the back of the throat. Um, one thing that, you know, the, this is not a flap, like uh, parents oftentimes think something's flapping around in the back of the throat or that this is really a static procedure. There is, it's a bridge, it's, a, it's tissue that is inset, uh, you know, hopefully permanently um, that, uh, blocks the air, uh, the, the space where the child's losing air. Um, so this is essentially, this is kind of showing where the pharyngeal flap would sit. And this is what it looks like uh, with nasal pharyngoscopy. So again, this is the back of the nose up here. This is the soft palate down here. And this is that bridge that is the pharyngeal flap. So there are ports on either side that are left open for breathing, because obviously we still want this patient to be able to breathe through their nose. And so um, there are ports left open laterally. And then this patient, uh, when they are speaking, ideally they're gonna close around those ports. So close off the ports with the lateral wall movement and then again, we get full closure and a blockage of this central gap where this patient was previously leaking air. So I have a, a pre-op video here and some post-op video. So this is the patient's pre-op before pharyngeal flap. Try. 
can see the air bubbling up, uh, showing that this patient has a consistent central gap here. Oops. And then this is post-op. So this is a picture of uh, her with her pharyngeal flap now. And we'll take a listen. And you can see that there's a, this is sitting right where that bubbling was previously occurring. And so the, the bubbling is uh, blocked by the pharyngeal flap and the patient's no longer leaking air out her nose. And her speech sounds a lot better. Uh, the, sphinct, the second surgery uh, procedure is a sphincter pharyngoplasty. And this uh, takes flaps, kind of finger-like flaps uh, from the lateral posterior pharyngeal wall they're superiorly based and they're elevated to create a speed bump in the back of the nose. So they create a like a ridge or a bulk right here in the posterior pharyngeal uh, region at, at the level of the velopharynx and essentially shorten the distance that the soft palate has to travel in order to get the velopharyngeal space closed off. So there's no connections to the soft palate like there is with the pharyngeal flap. It's just kind of a, a ridge or a hunk of uh, you know a bulk of, of tissue back here. And uh, there is a great, if you guys are interested, YouTube video um, out of Seattle by Dr. Kathy C. Um, that shows um, in picture form and also in you know, real life surgery uh, uh, images how this procedure is done. And I think that uh, has, gives a great explanation of the sphincter pharyngoplasty um, procedure. The um, I guess I just touch here. This is where those flaps are taken from on the lateral uh, pharyngeal wall. They're lifted up and then the, they're sewn. Uh, they're kind of uh, fixed together. And this is showing that one, the flap from the right, the flap from the left are sewn to the pharyngeal wall, posterior pharyngeal wall up high, by, up here by the nasal pharynx. And, um, and then this is the kind of showing what that bulk or that ridge of tissue would look like and this is the soft palate being lifted up. So this is up high. You really, if you, if you release the soft palate down, you should not see this in the back of the throat. This should be up higher at the level of the velopharynx. The furlopalatoplasty is um, also described as a double opposing Z-plasty. And this is, you know, historically the surgical repair for a submucous cleft palate. It takes the inappropriately positioned levator palatini muscle um, and puts it into the proper direction. So it's supposed to be coming across here in this direction. Um, and this is what the Z-plasty the Z procedure uh, accomplishes. Also, because it is a Z-plasty, by the nature of that, it adds a length to the soft palate. And so the length of the soft palate also helps with um, closure of the velopharynx. And so the, the two together, you're realigning the muscle into the proper direction. You're adding length to the soft palate. Both of those um, help uh, get that soft palate closed or sorry, get that velopharynx closed. Uh, these are just some intraoperative pictures that I had of designing the Z-plasty, lifting up our flaps, um, and then kind of how it looks when we're closed. Um, just a few little specifics about the furlough. Uh, if there is a larger gap present, there is, are, um, you could consider combining a furlough and a sphincter pharyngoplasty. Uh, there's been some good, good uh, literature out about that procedure in combination. And then one, one procedure that appears to be gaining a lot of popularity is the uh, revision furlough. Um, and so basically re-furloughing your furlough. Um, and um, the mentors that I've talked to that have been doing this procedure felt like that, it, again, you get more length again on the soft palate, but then it also increases a lot of central bulk in that soft palate area. And both of these serve to help uh, with velopharyngeal closure. Um, patients, uh, this is just a really uh, like a take home message, particularly anybody that's even doing general um, otolaryngology or pediatric otolaryngology. Right now, the American Cleft Palate Association is recommending any patient with an isolated submucous cleft palate get tested for 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. 
And so if they are otherwise healthy and you diagnose them with a submucous cleft palate, they really should go on to get testing for 22Q um, because there's a, a pretty high hit rate of finding 22Q in, in kids that have isolated submucous cleft palate. The um, uh, fourth procedure is the injection pharyngoplasty. And so this is uh, where you actually are injecting uh, material into that velopharyngeal, kind of into the posterior pharyngeal wall uh, at the level of the velopharynx. And this is to kind of, uh, again, create bulk um, and uh, decrease the space or the distance that the soft palate has to close in order to get closure. And so people have, um, have done this where they're injecting into the posterior pharyngeal wall or injecting into the posterior soft palate. And various um, various materials have been injected, deflux, fat, uh, prolarin. Um, the uh, benefits, obviously, I mean, it, it's a much smaller procedure, uh, so you could avoid having to do a large, quote unquote, a larger procedure for a very small gap. Uh, the drawbacks that, um, you know, that are there are that there can be migration of the material or a, dissipa a dissipation of the injectable material over time, where you then you have to circle back and end up needing a, um, a you know, a, one of the more formal VPI surgeries um, uh, in the end. I have not, uh, my mentors uh, felt like uh, they weren't having very good success uh, with these injections. And so uh, this isn't something that I have done in my practice yet, but uh, certainly there are, there are studies out there um, of authors that have great success with this. So um, something to, to be aware of and to keep in your repertoire of VPD surgical options. Uh, the fourth is also is it's kind of a, another new one that's on the scene. Um, this is the buckle flap. And essentially, this is a double opposing buccinator myomucosal flap. And it is used as an advancement flap between the heart and the soft palate. The heart and the soft palate are literally disconnected. And you are inset uh, it, it, with a buckle flap in between the two. And so you gain all of this length um, on your velum or the soft palate essentially gains a lot of length due to this advancement flap or this buckle flap that sits in between the hard palate and the soft palate. So um, this is a procedure that I have not uh, attempted yet myself either, but uh, is gaining a lot of popularity. Um, and there's a great, there's some great articles uh, that are coming out uh, recently uh, about uh, people's experience with this and then and their success rates. So, uh, you know, we've got talked about all these different surgeries. How do we pick which one? Um, and this is really, uh, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. The patient factors is there's there's something about the patient, the syndrome that they have, hypotonia, prior surgeries, underlying obstructive sleep apnea, they're going to make you pick one surgery over the other. Um, the gap size may steer you in a different uh, direction or may steer you toward one uh, or uh, other of the surgical options. Pharyngeal flaps are historically been used for like the really, really, really large gaps. Um, but even that I think would vary among surgeons. Um, closure pattern. This is the, the I think the in-service test answer that you guys will potentially get is that um, the circular closure pattern better fits the nature of a pharyngeal flap versus a coronal closure pattern where you don't have much lateral wall motion to close around your pharyngeal flap. So the coronal closure pattern seems to lend itself better to the sphincter pharyngoplasty. And that's kind of the quote unquote test answer, but that doesn't always necessarily hold true um, because we're factoring all these other things in um, in real life. And then surgeon preference, there's actually been some studies about, you know, a lot of the gaps you can get closed with any, you know, with, with a number of any of these uh, procedures. It really just depends what the surgeon's most comfortable with and, um, you know, what they're, what they're, what they feel like they can get that gap closed the best with. And so this is why I think the art of VPD surgery is selecting the best procedure for the patient and then further, further tailoring that procedure to the patient's needs. Uh, intraoperatively. Um, real briefly, so we can get to our cases, um, surgical risk to talk to the family about. These to all, to some degree, obstruct a portion of the airway. And so talking about obstructive sleep apnea or obstructive breathing at night. Um, failure to improve the symptoms. 
the literature shows about an 80 to 90 percent success rate with these surgeries and um, we'll talk a little bit more about how to gate how to how to quantify success but it is important to talk to the families about the you know the surgery might not uh, in, improve the patient's speech usually in my experience that's due to some healing issues if that if it does happen uh, and that can be a very you know just your flap doesn't heal and it, it scars in it scars too low um, it, it has a dehiscence or a palatal fissure um, so healing issues can occur and then I, in my experience that usually leads to the the failure to improve the symptoms. And then we may need to do additional procedures. So we may need to do revisions or we may need to add another procedure to what we've already done to help the patient get uh, completely closed uh, uh, from a VPD standpoint. Nasopharyngeal stenosis, anytime we're operating and adding tissue and uh, in the nasopharyngeal area, we can get a complete nasopharyngeal stenosis. I've seen a couple of these, uh, thankfully not on my patients, but um, uh, this is obviously a big, big problem, a hard problem to fix, but it's extremely rare, but it, you want to make sure your families and you are aware of this risk. So post-op, what are these, uh, uh, for, for me, uh, what happens after surgery, these patients are admitted to the floor for observation. Some institutions do um, ICU monitoring overnight. So again, these are going to be super surgeon dependent. The, um, and, uh, but I'll just share with you kind of what, what my regimen is. They do, the patients do a pourable diet, meaning essentially anything that they can get to pour out of a cup um, for the first two weeks. This is really what the families complain of the most, the, the diet, uh, the kids are really fed up with, a, a, you know, the, the kind of liquidy diet for the first two weeks. And then they do a soft diet uh, for one week. Again, this is really gonna vary uh, by surgeon um, on those recommendations. I make them take a four to six week rest um, from speech therapy and then they can start back up. I know some surgeons will wait up to three months or longer before letting the patients resume speech therapy. They see me in clinic a couple of weeks after surgery really just to kind of check in and see how the immediate recovery has gone. Um, the, the more important visit is that they come back to the VPD clinic with my speech therapist uh, at three months post-op where we do a speech evaluation. Um, and see how we compare from our preoperative speech, eva uh, speech evaluation. We really reserve rescoping of uh, patients uh, if they, uh, for patients that have persistent VPD or healing concerns. Um, and so most of the patients don't require another scope um, if they're doing really well. And then if they're having persistent snoring or concerns for sleep apnea, then we recommend a, a sleep study at about three months post-op. Uh, it's important to let the families know these surgeries can take six to 12 months to see the maximal speech benefit. So you got to tell the families this is not a quick fix. They're not going to walk out of the hospital with perfect speech. And in a lot of cases, the patient still needs some post-op speech therapy, particularly children that already have underlying articulation errors. So we can fix the air loss out their nose, but we can't fix all the other speech issues that are going on. So if there's multiple layers to this, they may need... Um, you know, a lot, a lot of speech therapy after the surgery. So it's important for the family to know it's not just a quick uh, fix. Um, how we grade the surgical outcomes. Um, we do that again, um, we're using our speech sample. Um, I think this is why it's important to have a consistent speech therapist team. Um, some institutions use na nasometry. Um, again, that has a kind of an objective number that that gives you, but it does have some limitations and, and requires a lot of patient participation. We uh, don't routinely use this at our institution, but I know a lot do. Um, again, we don't traditionally rescope, and I do think it's important to be measuring how the surgery, uh, you know, post surgery, how the patient's feeling about their quality of life improvement. Okay, so I've got about 10 minutes to run through some case presentations here, and then um, certainly, hopefully, I'll have some time for questions as well. But just wanted to give you a sense for kind of what my practice looks like, a, a smattering of patients that, um, that I've seen over the years. This is a seven-year-old with uh, 22Q deletion syndrome, um, developmental delay, and her speech was one of the most severely affected, very, very difficult to understand. Um, here's her preoperative video. 
So she has a really wide gap. And um, so for her and, and for a lot of children with 22Q, they require these really wide pharyngeal flaps. Um, I did do a staged tonsillectomy on her uh, uh, in order to help reduce the post-operative risk of OSA since I was uh, doing such a wide flap. And uh, post-operatively, she was much easier to understand. The grandma that was taking care of her was super excited, uh, but she still had uh, she she was she still had mild hypernasality, mild to moderate. And so I did rescope her, um, and I'll show you guys. This is one of the the instances where this really wide pharyngeal flap that I made really shrunk down to being much skinnier than I was hoping, and also much skinnier than what the patient needed. So this is her. Uh, this is her pharyngeal flap here in the middle, and you'll see that, that she's still leaking a fair bit of air along her lateral sides. So what I did for her is I actually took that pharyngeal flap down and did a revision pharyngeal flap. And she's actually doing really well now, had much better healing with this second one. Um, second patient is a three-year-old with hypernasality and a bifid uvula. We had suspicion for a submucous cleft palate and that was confirmed on our scope exam, but I'll give you a little sense for, so this is again a, a quick shot here. Of, you see this midline divot or the seagull sign, very classic for a submucous cleft palate. Uh. <laughs> so she underwent a furlough, a palatoplasty. Her genetic testing uh, returned as negative and she uh, did quite well uh, as well. This is a cleft lip and palate patient uh, that had already had a furlough palatoplasty with a persistent uh, VPI, uh, and she was referred from our cleft team for further evaluation and potential need for a, a, a pharyngeal flap. Interestingly, her speech actually didn't sound as bad as her gap was much larger uh, than what her speech would have led on. She has a uh, more of a coronal closure pattern and the lateral walls aren't moving, uh, sorry, as well. Um, and so she's a great example of where multiple surgical options would probably uh, help really um, surgeon dependent. Some may choose to do uh, a revision uh, furlough for her. Some may choose to do a sphincter phrengoplasty. Uh, in my hands, due to her gap size, I did recommend a pharyngeal flap, which she did really well with, and she's had a resolution of her, her uh, resonance uh, issues. Um, but again, kind of showing that multiple surgery, I mean, different types of surgeries could all be used uh, for that particular gap. Uh, this is a, uh, an interesting patient that we, um, a uh, six-year-old female hypernasality, mostly uh, when we're doing the speech samples, we're noticing this mostly on S's and Z's. Uh, and so she was uh, what we, we assumed was VP mislearning. However, uh, the parents and the speech therapists were really concerned because she was not improving with speech therapy. And so there was some concern that there was an underlying structural abnormality. And so we did go ahead and scope her. And as you watch the scope, you'll be able to see on the sounds uh, on certain sounds, she gets great closure. And then when she uses the S and the Z sound, you'll start to see the bubbling of the air and uh, showing that her palate is working fine. It's just on certain sounds, phenome specific or sound specific, she's leaking air. So she's a VP mislearning kid. Let's take a look. Good closure on that one. There's the S, see how that bubbling. <laughs> 
Same with a Z has a gap, a central gap there with her Z sound. Um, so this was uh, based on our scope exam. We did diagnose her with VP mislearning and recommended continued speech therapy uh, for her. And uh, she's a kid that we said follow up if this isn't getting better in six months. But the our speech therapist was able to give the school's therapist some really specific techniques to assist her. Um, and last I heard, she was doing quite well with those. Um, I believe this is the last one. This is a 10-year-old uh, female with worsening nasal speech. Um, and uh, she's interesting because it's, she's 10. So this is like uh, kind of occurring later, quote unquote, later in life, rather than the kind of classic three, four, five, six-year-olds that we see. And uh, she was having a lot of uh, issues at school. She was getting made fun of, and she was really withdrawing from social settings. Um, the parents were concerned uh, as well. And, uh, and so the, 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 we'll take a look at her video and then we'll talk about her. So um, she had, you know, when we start to see uh, VPD uh, come up in kids that are around 9, 10, 11, this can be, uh, a, you know, due to adenoid regression. So all of a sudden the adenoids are starting to fade away. And uh, some of these kids have been relying on the adenoids uh, for, to help them get uh, VP closure. And so as those adenoids fade away, all of a sudden, like again, 11 year old, nine year old, 10 year old, you can start to see uh, this BPD becoming an issue for them. So for her, she didn't have any signs or uh, exam findings of a submucous cleft palate, uh, but she did have this small central gap, which again would be uh, amendable to multiple surgical options. And, uh, you know, we did, a, uh, I did a sphincter pharyngoplasty on her and she did great. Uh, but, you know, she had this really small gap, but she was, a, 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 in, and I thought, you know, fairly intelligible if you hear it on the, the uh, scope, but it was really creating a big impact on her quality of life. And so I think it, the, it, that's why it's important to not just rate, just make decisions based on the scope exam. You really got to factor in the patient's quality of life and kind of what their, what the speech issues are creating for them. So in conclusion, I just wanted to, you know, highlight a few things. I, I believe that treating VPD does require a team approach, which is best served in a, in, in a team setting where you can collaborate with your speech therapist and the, the speech surgeon. Um, we found the child life specialist to be super helpful with our scope of procedures and getting high quality uh, scope procedures accomplished even in young children. And then again, just to highlight, I think that the you know, there are multiple surgeries that can treat kind of similar gaps uh, that patients may have. And really the art of speech surgery is selecting the, the correct procedure and then further tailoring that to that, you know, the, the correct procedure in your hands and then tailoring that to the, you know, the specific patient intraoperatively. Um, and so I think uh, I have, I can't see the questions, uh, Dr. Gupta, if there are any, um, but I know we have just a two minutes or so for any questions. Looks like one just popped up in the Q&A about location of injection pharyngoplasty. Um, I am not seeing those, so I need to, maybe I can close out of my, are you able to see it and read it to me? Yeah, yeah, it says location of injection pharyngoplasty inferior oh, to the okay. adenoid pads, question from SLP. Uh, yes, it would be inferior to the adenoid, just, just underneath. 